Today's theme, today's message or conversation is all about fighting for our children. Uh, There is a battle going on for our children today. And if you don't recognize it, then your head is in the sand. You're just not paying attention. But every, everywhere from the womb, there's an attack upon our children, to our schools, from kindergarten, first, and second, third grade, trying to indoctrinate them into a new ideology that is anti-scriptural, all the way from uh, transgenderism to uh, everything that you could imagine our kids are being hit with and our families are being hit with. And what I'm finding is, and the reason I'm willing to wade into some awkward conversation is because if you don't hear the conversation here at church, you're probably not going to hear it anywhere else. Not, not in a biblical way. Uh, but we've had everything from our our kids. We had a four year old, one of our four year olds here this, uh, last week, one of our staff kids, Another kid said to them here in our Mother's Day out, uh, the conversation with four-year-olds was, uh, hey, it's okay for us to marry boys. These were two little boys. It's okay for us to marry boys. And the little boy, the four-year-old, came home to his mommy, one of our staff, and said, "Uh, this is what this boy said. Is this right? So here's what I know. If kids at four years of age are having these kind of conversations, well, it's because they're not hearing the right conversations in other places. So we've got to have the conversation. We've got to talk about it. Our schools have become indoctrination camps where they're not teaching just math, reading, science, uh, arithmetic. They're not. No, it's become a place for social indoctrination. We're going to talk about some of that today. Our school boards seem to be shutting down parents who want to be involved. Uh, Even some uh, targeting. Our DOJ has targeted some parents, calling them domestic terrorists. Uh, for wanting to have involvement in the curriculum that's being taught in the schools. We've got libraries with drag queen reading time. Uh, In fact, just here the other day, I saw, uh, and and listen, please understand. And I think everybody here who's part of Freedom Church understands this and knows this. Every single person on this planet is welcome in this house. We all know that. But we all recognize that every single one of us, myself included, was born with sin. We were born with sinful tendencies. And every one of those tendencies, whether it's uh, whatever it is, has to be surrendered when we bow at the cross of Jesus Christ. Everything. I don't, I don't have the right to live just the way I want to. I don't have the right to live the way I feel. Sometimes I feel like being very unchristian. I don't have that luxury. I don't have that right. I have to surrender that and follow the word of God and follow what Jesus says. So that's that's awkward. But the problem that we have within our world today is that we have chosen to just pick and choose what we want to hear and obey out of the scriptures. And we've allowed our culture to frame what is moral and what is not, what's acceptable, what it's not. Well, we're going to always go back. I'm going to tell you right now, Freedom Church, listen, I'm always going to go back to the Word of God. If you want to know where I stand, we're going to go back to the Word of God. And I'm not going to let people pick and choose you know, scriptures to just base an opinion or an ideology or a theology. We're going to stand on the Word of God. But here just recently, I read uh, an article from a school down near the, in Austin, right here in Texas, and they took a, a, a title from a, a television program to try to uh, make a point for advertising purposes. And it was called Queer Eye for the Junior High. And it was an event where they wanted all the students in this junior high to come out to support an LGBTQ uh, IAS plus uh, or something uh, event. But it was, and, and we've seen it, you've seen it where there have been teachers that have taken upon themselves to have their entire classes uh, pledge allegiance to a gay flag. And listen, uh, people can choose whatever they want, but they don't have the right to indoctrinate our children. They don't have that, nobody has that right. Uh, so we need to do our part. We've seen some teachers uh, that have encouraged 
uh, children to go to YouTube grooming channels. If they can't get affirmation for the way they feel at home, you can go here and find other adults and other people that will affirm your feelings and affirm your thoughts. Well, that's just, we're, we're, just, no, we're not going to fly with that. We're going to fight for our children. Um, so where, where has this resulted? That What has been the result of this? Well, there's an attitude about sex that you can do whatever you want. You can express your love through sex to whomever you want. And that's just not the biblical way. Any sex outside of marriage is wrong, period. That's kind of the nutshell of sexual education, biblical sexual education. Anything outside of marriage is wrong. Uh, your gender, we've been taught your gender is fluid. It's ever-changing. You can just listen to your body, your feelings. Our bodies and our feelings tell us a lot of things, but that's why we have the word of God to govern us and to guide us. Uh, there's been rebellion against uh, parental authority, uh, trying to uh, subvert parental acknowledgement, and, and we've, we've been taught masculinity is bad and feminism is good, uh, but yet we've got uh, men stepping into the world of feminism and destroying women's sports, and it's just there's craziness. And the outcome so far has been destruction of identity, destruction of God-given uniqueness, destruction of the reproduction of the next generation, death, depression, uh, suicide, uh, drug use is at an all-time high, all high. There's a fear of standing up to these ideologies because fear of being shamed or being uh, silenced or being canceled. And so what a lot of churches have done and what a lot of people have done, we just sat back quiet, not said anything, and just tried to get along. Well, at some point, you got to stand up and you got to teach the truth. And that's why I've never been afraid to take on some tough issues. I know it makes some people uncomfortable. I get it. But we are not going to avoid the tough issues at Freedom. So to help me with some of these tough issues, <laughs> since we're talking about our children, we're talking about education, I brought in the president of Southwestern University, 22 years as president of Southwestern, uh, my brother, Dr. Kermit Bridges. See you. Thank you. I needed some help, and you know we always call on Big Brother to help whenever things get tough. And uh, bro, I need some help tackling some of these tough issues. Well, you've called me in on a tough day. Yes, I have. <laughs> Nothing easy about this. And of course, our mom, she bailed on us today. Uh, we just want everybody to know, she bailed on us. She's out running around with her girlfriends. I think she's backslidden. We need to pray for her. Uh, and y'all tell her I said so when you see her next week. Uh, but thank you so much for coming. And Jan, Jan's down on the front row. Jan, would you stand? Let everybody see my beautiful sister-in-law. Uh, so 22 years as president of Southwestern, I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes. Seen a lot. Seen a lot. And in, in terms of this particular subject, uh, one thing that I have I've shared in the last couple of services when you look at just the shift in what students know, even students coming to Southwestern, and you would say, well, you would expect a student coming to a Christian university uh, is, is naturally going to have, a, uh, you know, more likely going to have a, a you know, greater, greater hunger for the Word of God, et cetera. But when you, when you compare what students know about the Word of God in 2000, when I, I began as president, to the group that will be showing up here next fall, there is a significant difference. There is a significant erosion in terms of biblical literacy. Uh, not to mention the buying into, accepting some of the values that are being espoused by our culture that are clearly contrary to the Word of God. There's a, you know, in other words, far more questioning, far more uh, openness to things that 22 years ago even, that incoming freshman class would not have been willing to buy into. What are some of those things? What are some of those uh, issues that seem to be shifting in the students' minds? Well, I would, so much of it, of course, comes under the, the banner of, of social justice. And I would, I describe that as the new religion of, of the United States of America. And it, it sounds has, really pure. Oh, sure it does. Because justice is a, is a central biblical concept. And please understand, I am very much for biblical justice. 
But here's, unfortunately, what, what social justice has done, it's taking and twisting certain truths. Uh, one of the, I guess I would say, the holy scriptures of, of uh, social justice would be, you know, for instance, abortion. Uh, the, the right for a baby to be killed at any point from conception right up to birth. Uh, anywhere along that spectrum, for any and every reason, uh, this is... This is horrible. I mean, we we've just seen in the last uh, the last few weeks uh, that the Senate has tried to. In fact, half the Senate voted for a bill that would allow for that. In other words, even more extreme than than uh, than Roe v. Wade. And and by the way, Roe v. Wade is however you feel like feel about that from a political perspective. It has enabled the United States to be one of the most radical nations in the world with regard to. Uh, excessive abortion policies. What do you mean by that? Well, well, for instance, we have in the United States, we are among a an infamous list of seven nations in the world that have the most extreme positions on abortion. In other words, the the most allowance for the taking of a baby's life than any. We are among the top seven. You want to who else? You want to know who else is in that list? Well, three totalitarian regimes that you don't want to be mentioned with, communist China, North Korea, and Vietnam. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. And this is the United States of America. And so we've, we've got major problems. Another is, is the area of, of the, the whole LGBTQ movement and, and transgenderism. And, you know, you, you also see it with the plus at the end. And the, and the plus... You know, the plus means not just the allowance for an individual in the United States to pursue whatever you know, sexual uh, relationship they desire, but it is silencing any voice that would speak against that. In other words, you're being required to affirm. And if you don't affirm, you actually will be punished. Uh, an example, we are, we are on, the, on the verge, for instance, of Christian universities like Southwestern uh, having ac- our students having access to Pell Grants being denied. You take this a step further, and this has been going in this direction for some time. How can it be that in the state of Washington, you can have a, a 13-year-old girl who can begin to, uh, to, to get gender-affirming therapy without parental consent. And then it, it, gets, it gets far more worse. Or in Oregon, a 15-year-old girl that will have top surgery, that's double mastectomy without the parental approval of that. We are in dangerous times. Another, another area is, is the area of... Of, uh, of racism. Of course, we are all against racism, right. but, but the, the, the notion that our, that our nation as a whole is systemically racist, that everything, it's, 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 it, you know, it's been flawed from the founding all the way up to this point in time. It, it, in other words, it, it goes far beyond what, what Dr. King taught. You know, he, he dreamed that his children would, would one day be judged by the content of the character, not the, the color of their skin. No, no, the systemic, the, the, the whole idea of, of CRT, systemic relation, uh, racism, is it, it flips that. You actually are prejudged as racist based on the color of your skin, not the content of your character. And so this, this is an example of the things that our students are being well, it's being crammed down their throats and there's such a high level of peer pressure involved and they are susceptible to this. And if we don't do an adequate job as the church and as individual parents in, in preparing them and training them, we will lose this generation. And we are seeing more and more, uh, more of our, our kids lost. Just look around. Just look around. Look at how many were once in the church and are no longer in the church. It's a crisis. Well, and we see this ideology, this social justice religion, uh, we see it being promoted in every form of media, from every movie to every television show to every commercial. Uh, it's the forms of this are being implemented into every one of those areas just to normalize it 
and it's become so normal that it becomes very difficult uh, for our students to be able to uh, stand up against this in school. So that's why even today, part of this is simply to arm you, to give you tools, to give you the, the confidence that you can stand upon biblical truth and, and know that you stand on what is right. Uh, so how did we get here? How do we get to this place right now? Because we've, we've come a long way. Yeah, we have. And, and, and it's not good. That, no, it, 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 the reality is there's been a, a gradual decline in the, the spiritual vitality of the church. I'm speaking of the church as a whole, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ, all churches, all denominations, especially over the course of the last 120 years. Uh, and and a, lot of this, a lot of this began to deteriorate in the early 1900s, the, the, the 30s, the 40s, 50s, where you had some prominent liberal theolo, the, theolo, theologians, excuse me, that began to, to, to teach and criticize Scripture to the point where it, it attacked the foundation of what we would understand as absolute truth. In other words, if you can't have confidence that the Bible is actually God's Word, then you, it, it begins to shift everything. How can you, if, if you have doubt that this is true, then, then what, what about this over here? It becomes very relative. What's true for you isn't necessarily true for me. Uh, it, it began in seminaries uh, where you had uh, pastors, future denominational leaders being trained, and they began to have their faith in the absolute certainty of God's word uh, challenged. And then over the course of the time, it just continued to increase. You know, it starts small. It starts with, uh, well, I'm not so sure about this, or maybe I feel a little pressure about uh, tackling a difficult subject, and so I'm just going to ignore that. And then, well, I'm going to tackle the subject, but I'm going to I'm going to twist the scripture to make it say what I, what I feel like it should say to the point where then you're actually, and you've got, you've got entire denominations outright condoning sinful behavior that's prohibited by scripture. You do know we have that today. Mm -hmm. And so this, there's a direct correlation with the, with this, this deterioration that has occurred within the church of Jesus Christ and the church's ability to positively impact the culture is salt and light. The, 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 the decline in church attendance, the decline in biblical literacy, as I, I just, as I just mentioned. All of these things making the church and Christians not only, they're, they're, less, they're less capable of being salt and light, but even, even worse, they are susceptible to turning their back on their faith and having their complete, uh, a complete questioning of, of spiritual authority. So just to reemphasize, we stand upon the Word of God as the whole Word of God, the absolute truth, and that's what we use to govern our lives. Uh, we don't pick and choose. However, it sure makes us seem like in the world and our students out there, like we're kind of prudes, you know? I don't, nobody uses that word anymore. Uh, yeah. We're we're sticking the muds. I mean, we're like, how? Well, I mean, and this is this is what this decline has. I mean, you can you can see this uh, over the course of these decades. At one at one time, even people who didn't go to church, there was a there was if they didn't go to church, their mom and dad and their grandparents went to church, and they had a they they actually reverenced. The word of God. They may not be living by it, but they reverenced it. And then it began to shift to, well, I, I respect people of faith. And then, and then I, well, they're, that's, that's quaint. That's old fashioned. It's, it's helpful for them to be around. And then it moves from quaint old fashioned to, well, this is beginning a little, this is, this is being a bit of an inconvenience to me to the point where today scriptural teaching is viewed as, as, as harmful. And they, mm. in turn, are hostile toward it. This is the shift in culture yep. in just a hundred years. Mm. And so that's why we have just remained silent. We, for the most part, we just not wanted to take on that that battle. But that's why I wanted today to say we've got to fight for our children. So what can we do? What can we do to start turning this back around? Well. One of the first things that you, you can do is 
And you're, you're accomplishing this by your presence here this morning. You're a part of a Bible-believing church where the, the, the truth is proclaimed and, and a, a pastoral team that is committed to the Word of God is not going to compromise and it is willing to, and re, it is willing to tackle the tough issues. That's number one. You, you're, you're a part of this church. Now, don't just be an occasional part of it, you know, showing up every, once a month or so. Get here with your kids or your grandkids if, if you have to be the one to get them here. Every time the doors are open. Every time the doors are open. Say that again, President. Uh, Dr. President. I, well, you, you, you call attention to this in, in one of the earlier services. I mean, you think about just the, the hours with which, in, yep. in which kids are being indoctrinated on the other side. My goodness, think of the few opportunities that we have. Take advantage of every age-appropriate program that Freedom has to offer. Pastoral staff who are serving with specializations in those areas, they're there to support you. They're there to help you. Take advantage of that, Mom and Dad. Yep. And, uh, and, and by the way, allowing, allowing students, you know, having this feeling that I am not going to force my kids to go to church, do you take that attitude about school itself? Come on. Stay right I mean, what, there a little if, while. Stay if, there a little while. What if son or daughter says, I don't feel like going to school? You going to buy that? Of course you're not going to buy that. Well, how much more important is church? Yes. Sorry to get a little passionate there. <laughs> it's, I like it. I like it. In fact, I'll just add in right there that I understand why some parents, when you're disciplining your kids, because there's a social element, a fellowship element with other kids. But I'm just going to tell you right now, if your form of discipline punishment for your kid is to keep them from coming to church or keep them from coming to youth group. Bad idea. Okay. I'm just telling you right now, bad idea. Keep anything. Take their phone away. Take their TV privileges away. Take their gaming privileges away. Take, take any other fellowship activity away. Don't keep them from church. <laughs> you got to get them here. Keep food away from them. I don't care. Starve them. Just don't keep them from church. There you go. That's right. Call it a fast. All right. So you got it. You, you got to get them. You got to get them to church. You got to be here every time these doors are open. Look, if you're not ordinarily coming on Wednesday night, come on Wednesday night. Get here on Wednesday night. That means you're here for about an hour on Sunday morning. We're here for about an hour on Wednesday night, hour and 15 minutes. That's still, that's only two hours compared to the eight hours per day your kids are at school and away from you. You need this church to help the fight for your children. But then you also, we need to do something at home. And we had the privilege growing up with a mom and dad that believed in teaching us the word of God at home. So we had devotions nearly every, uh, every evening. Yeah, we did. And it wasn't, you know, you said it earlier, it's not like we were really enjoying it as kids, <laughs> but, but dad did it. He, he would read a scripture and this was kind of my method. Dad would read a scripture. Usually it was a, a chapter out of the Bible. And then he would turn and say, okay, Kermit, what did you think about that? Kendall, what did you get out of that? Keenan, what did you think out of that? And uh, many times dad would be reading. I'd be listening for the one thought. Uh, that's mine. That's what I'm going to say. You know, and then, okay, lock it in, lock it in. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. And I just kind of waited till he was finished. I wasn't always, you know, soaking in everything. And then, it would, but the bad thing was, is when my brother would use my point and I had nothing, and I got nothing now. Uh, devotions were kind of fun, challenging, but we did it every evening in my home. We did it every morning at breakfast time. Uh, regardless of whether you do it in the morning or evening, you just have to do it. And I'm going to give you some resources here in just a moment. Uh, so we've got to, we've got to have them here at church. We've got to uh, teach the word at home. But then also when it comes to school, what are some things we can do? Well, you you don't abdicate your responsibility as a parent. This, this idea that, uh, and, and you're, being, you're being told that, you know, that educators know best. You get, I'm an educator. I'm, I'm married to an educator. I have the highest respect. Uh, but you, you don't simply accept that fact. If you, you've got to engage the school system. You've got, to, you've got to be there. You need to know what is being taught. And unfortunately, 
we are seeing far too many times where you've got external forces that are influencing uh, educators, school systems, and they are imposing some of these these damaging philosophies, this curriculum coming in. I mean, how, how tragic. You used to just count on the fact that your kids was going to go in there, they're going to get a great education, they're going to, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, they're going to get the basics, and you're, they're going to prepare them for college. That's, it, it, now it's, it's more about indoctrinating them to this, this new religion. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you've got to be involved and thank the Lord for Christian schools. If we can have our kids in Christian schools or those that choose to homeschool, God bless you moms and dads that do that. But you know what? If you can't and your kids are, even if they are in Christian school, but even if they're, but if mostly if they're in public school, you need to be involved in uh, what's being taught. You need to know the teachers. You need to know the principals. You need to know the school board. You need to be involved. And then when you graduated from high school, you send them to Southwestern University. That's where you send them. And if you can't get on campus there, then you go through Freedom Leadership School and you're an online student and you get 50% off tuition by being a part of Freedom Leadership School. And, but then listen, if you can't do that or your occupation or your, uh, your degree takes you some other place, you're in some other school, then when our kids are in college, Moms and dads and youth pastor, youth ministry as well, we need to make sure that our kids are plugged into a local church while they are away at college, that they are plugged into a campus ministry at that college. We don't just send them away and hope and pray everything works out all right. We lose too many kids when they go to college. We're going to fight for our children because your children are worth it. Amen. Would you give my brother a great big hand? Thank you, President Bridges. Proverbs 22, 6 says this, you start children off in the way they should go. Even when they're old, they will not turn from it. It starts in the home here at church and your involvement with them at school. That's what you just have to do. It's a non-negotiable. So you've got to make sure that we start them off right. Now there's some simple do's and don'ts that I'll give you here in one minute. Here's how we start our children off. Number one, you got to discipline, be disciplined, love and discipline, love and discipline. And discipline doesn't mean punishment. This means you give them boundaries, healthy boundaries, discipline, be consistent, be fair, be rational. You got to model it, be a disciple of Christ. Teach them to be a disciple of Christ. You got to teach them the Bible, teach them the word, uh, teach them how to pray, preserve their innocence. Uh, you get, you'll know when it's right to introduce certain subjects to your kids. Some will bring the subject up at home. Some, if you're engaging with them, finding out what their conversations are like at school, you'll know when to introduce certain subjects to them, uh, the most difficult ones, but preserve their innocence. Don't do this. Don't decline to interfere. Get involved in their life. Interfere. <laughs> Stand in the way. Be the guardian for your children. Refuse or don't refuse to show grace because our kids are going to make mistakes just like we made mistakes. Show them a lot of grace and then don't micromanage their lives. And what I mean by that is, I know it sounds like, wait, you're, you got them involved at home, at church, at school. It sounds like micromanagement. No, when you taught your kid to ride a bike, you finally took off those uh, training wheels. You did that, but you had to let them take a risk of learning to ride on their own. Did they fall? Yeah, they probably fell. You couldn't run along beside them and hold the bike forever. You had to let go at some point. When they fell, what did you do? You picked them up, you dusted them off, you wiped away their tears, you put them back on that bike and you taught them to ride again. Same way where our kids played sports. When they, if they played football, you put pads on them, taught them how to tackle right, you sent them out there knowing they were probably going to get their brains knocked out of them. But you taught them right, and then you sent them out. You can't micromanage. You can't hold them. You can't lock them up in their room till they're 21. I know some of us would like to, but you can't. You got to train them up right. Train them in the Word of God. 